bristling with firepower and speed, American and North Vietnamese airmen go head to head in the skies over Vietnam. The war pitted Soviet-made MiGs, fast and nimble, against America's newest fighter jet, the F-4 Phantom. Airborne life and death standoffs would last only seconds as combatants furiously maneuvered for an opportunity to fire their lethal air-to-air -air missiles. The intense battles that ensued defined the future of an entirely new era of air combat. By March of 1965, the war in Vietnam had reached a fever pitch. Thousands of men and aircraft were committed to the conflict. Eventually, American warplanes were launched on around-the-clock sorties in an air campaign called Rolling Thunder. Their goal was to crush the communist Vietnamese insurgency known as the Viet Cong. American air crews aimed for the insurgent supply lines flowing from the north. U.S. military leaders also hoped that the campaign would serve as a warning to the North Vietnamese. For American airmen, the threat in the South and the North was radically different. In South Vietnam, American airplanes dominated the skies. U.S. planes and pilots handily survived even the most intense attacks from the Viet Cong operating on the ground below. However, in North Vietnam, air crews faced something far more formidable, significant firepower and a well-trained enemy. Throughout the mid-1960s, the North Vietnamese placed anti-aircraft artillery along the most common routes used by American planes and around the major target areas. Also, they unveiled the first surface-to-air missiles, Soviet-built SA-2s. The radar-controlled SA-2 could strike down U.S. planes with a range of 60,000 feet and a speed of Mach 3. But perhaps the greatest challenge to U.S. air power came from the North Vietnamese Air Force, trained and equipped by the Soviet Union and Red China. They flew the relatively slow but agile Soviet-built MiG-17s and increasingly faster and more heavily armed MiG-21s. The more nimble airframes gave the North Vietnamese a distinct advantage over the Americans. U.S. crews flew the F-105 Thunder Chief. Against a MiG, these fighter bombers were cumbersome and difficult to maneuver. Simply put, the primary strike aircraft of the Rolling Thunder campaign could be easily outrun and ultimately shot down by the enemy. Once engaged, the best way for American planes to survive the confrontations was to drop their ordnance and hit the deck. But this wasn't an option for fighters engaged in a war. Instead, it was time for the U.S. to unveil the latest weapon in its arsenal, the F-4 Phantom. The new fighter jet was expected to defeat the MiGs from long range with little warning. But that was only a partial solution. Too often, American air crews would have to face the MiGs in close-range dogfights, something for which they were extremely ill-prepared. I went through pilot training. OK, that took a year. Then I went through six months checkout in the F-4. OK? And then I flew the F-4 for about six more months. And so then I got two years invested, and I'm a fighter pilot. And all of a sudden, the Vietnam War starts getting up, and they pull out some of these old books that guys had written back in the Korean War days and World War II. And in there, they're talking about maneuvers that I had no concept of, uh, barrel roll attacks, high-speed yo-yo, 
low speed yo-yo, vertical rolling scissor, a scissor. Not only did I know, not know what the maneuver was, I had never heard the term before. And these were all fighter maneuvers that you use to get behind a guy to shoot him down. Initially, in the US Navy, the air-to-air -air combat mission was split between F-4 crews and the pilots of the F-8 Crusader, a single-seat fighter capable of operating from the shorter decks of older carriers. Eventually, the Phantoms became the Navy's weapon of choice to counter the rising MiG threat. Their lethality was due to the two types of missiles they carried, the heat-seeking AIM-9 Sidewinder or the radar-homing AIM-7 Sparrow. The capability of the missiles far surpassed anything in the Soviet inventory. They gave the F-4 the ability to kill precisely at great distances, up to 12 miles. However, the missiles were not made to shoot down small, nimble MiGs at close range. They were constructed for what military designers believed would be the next war. The attitude back then in 64 and 65 was, ain't gonna be that kind of war anymore. It's gonna be against bombers straight and level, shooting missiles, and uh, they can't escape these missiles. They're too smart and too fast and can pull too many Gs. Uh, so we went to war in the F-4 with no gun and the radar missile and the Sidewinder missile designed to shoot down bombers and they weren't all that great at that. F-4s were operated by a two-man crew. The pilot and trigger man sat in front, while the backseater used the radar to locate targets. Their lives were in each other's hands. Clear communication was a matter of survival. The guy in the back gets it on the radar and he says, okay, we got a bogey, 20 left, 10 up, 15 which is 15 miles. Okay, that's where he was when this guy saw him, thought about it, and told you. Okay, and, but everything is moving. It's, it's, you know, like six-dimensional because it's not just you moving. He's moving, too. So for, for him to be effective, he's got to be telling you that just constantly. Well, you can't. So you're just getting data bits. This verbal communication front to back was, was tough, very tough, and slow. Once the F-4s started closing in on the MiGs, pilot and navigator had to determine the best moment to unleash their weapons. The Sidewinder was designed to guide on the heat from jet exhaust and could only be launched from behind a MiG. The radar-guided Sparrow should have provided crews with a long-range acquisition advantage but under U.S. rules of engagement, the crew had to visually identify the aircraft, usually by making a close pass, before they could activate the missile's outdated guidance system. You had to wait four seconds before you could fire. You had to wait two seconds for the radar to settle. And this is an old analog radar set, tubes. Yeah. So we had to wait two seconds for the radar to settle down, and then another two seconds for the radar data to program the missile. You fired at three and a half seconds, and you had a stupid missile. So what you'd hear was, you're locked, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,000 fire. You know, so we had to have that four second time, and that's an eternity when uh, you're moving at supersonic speeds. Even after the pilot pulled the trigger, there was another second and a half delay before the missile fired, and the crew had to stay locked onto the MiG until the Sparrow struck an extremely difficult and dangerous feat to achieve in combat. North Vietnamese MiGs usually operated in well-coordinated teams. If an F-4 crew managed to engage one, they could count on the fact that others were waiting nearby. Ground-based radar operators controlled the MiGs. They dictated virtually every maneuver the pilots made. The tactic, known as GCI, or Ground Control Intercept, was a classic Soviet attack strategy that proved somewhat effective in Vietnam. GCI controllers continuously relayed the exact position of U.S. aircraft to MiG pilots, 
allowing the MiGs plenty of time to set up ambushes or to avoid attack. Something made easier by the Phantom's two powerful engines, they left notoriously large black smoke trails in the sky. Rolling Thunder's newest weapon was proving to be among its most vulnerable. Rolling Thunder, the air campaign launched against the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, has been underway for almost two years. At first, President Lyndon Johnson would only allow U.S. crews to attack a limited number of targets outside of North Vietnam's population centers. But the strategy had been ineffective. So military planners decided to send American planes to the heart of North Vietnam. Protecting the airspace around Hanoi and Haiphong were the best and brightest that North Vietnamese had to offer. They were flying the Soviet Union's latest aircraft, the MiG-21, a plane that was nearly twice as fast as the 17s, superior in every way to the F-105 fighter bomber and able to outmaneuver both the F-4 and F-8 Crusader. Also making it even more lethal than its MiG predecessors, the 21 could be armed with four Atoll missiles, the Soviet answer to the heat-seeking Sidewinder. To make the best use of their new weapons, MiG crews developed a new tactic. They remained hidden. Until the slower, less able American planes were so low on fuel that they had no choice but to jettison their payload to make it out alive. We didn't find them, they found us. They would usually come up and uh, try to make sneak attacks on the strike force, uh, hoping to get them to jettison their bombs and not make it to the target. And it would be sometimes a combination of MiG-17s and uh, one or two MiG-21s. The 17s would be used uh, as a decoy uh, to get the F-4s and the 105s to uh, forget about what they were supposed to be doing and try to go for the MiG-17s. And once your attention was diverted to the 17s, the MiG-21s would come through in a, a supersonic high-speed pass, uh, fire a couple of missiles, and away they go. Uh, and by this time, the MiG-17s have started to run, and so now the entire strike is disrupted. That was their goal. As the war continued on, F-4 crews became increasingly frustrated. They knew how to maneuver in a dogfight, but their missiles weren't right for the job. None had a kill rate higher than 15%. At close range, they were extremely difficult to use, and many simply failed to track properly or fire at all. To be truly lethal, the Phantoms needed a gun. One squadron took matters into their own hands. On the plane's belly, they mounted a 20 millimeter Gatling gun capable of firing 100 rounds per second. In May of 1967, for the first time ever, the men of the 366th Tactical Fighter Wing went into combat with bellies full of lead. Within a couple of weeks, the gunfighters, as they came to be known, had earned their first kills. They downed two MiGs in a single engagement. The Phantom Force was lethal on two fronts. Long-range missiles still took down the greatest number of MiGs. But close up, the new gun pods were proven effective. The Air Force put their improved weapon to good use. The Phantoms were sent in to protect the bomb-laden F-105s as they made their way toward their targets in North Vietnam. The heavy F-105s were no match for a MiG. If an enemy plane showed up, the F-4s sprang into action. If there weren't any MiGs in sight, then the F-4s were expected to head into the target area and drop their ordnance just like the F-105s, 
a job many crews didn't enjoy. Sometimes you might, you might say we sort of hoped that the MiGs would come up so that we wouldn't have to roll in on the target. Not that we felt that fighting the MiGs would be more fun than, than putting the bombs on the target. It is simply a matter of what the job was. Our job was to keep the MiGs off the 105s because their job was to put the bombs on the target. Big difference, uh, once the bombs are away, you cannot catch an F-105 on the way out. Those guys uh, would do their job, and then it was time for them to go home. For us, depending on who you were flying with, uh, you would put the bombs on the target, see that the 105s were out, and then turn around and go back and play. Uh, and by that, I mean you would go back and look for MiGs uh, to see if any of them were following the strike force, trying to get revenge kills or whatever you want to call it. American planes were too often the victims of MiG hit and runs on the way in or out of the target area. To counter this tactic, the Americans developed a plan. It would become one of the most famous ruses in the history of air combat. On January 2nd, dozens of planes from various squadrons and more than 30 Phantoms from the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing, or Wolfpack, launched on Operation Bolo an offensive attack on North Vietnam. The operation was conceived by the Wolfpack's fiery new commander, Colonel Robin Olds. Olds, like many others, became extremely frustrated. U.S. political leaders prevented him from going after the MiG bases, so that meant the only way to kill the enemy was in the air. His idea was simple. If the Phantoms could fool North Vietnamese radar operators into thinking that they were actually a flight of heavy fighter bombers, they could trap the MiGs in an air battle before the pilots realized their mistake. The Wolfpack's Phantoms mimicked every aspect of an F-105 or THUD strike force. They flew the same routes, at the same altitudes, air speeds, and times as the THUDs, and even carried the same electronic jamming pods so that they would appear on radar just like a flight of 105s. But the Phantoms were not carrying bombs. They were each armed with eight air-to-air -air missiles. Initially, the mission appeared to be a failure. There was a heavy overcast, and Colonel Old's flight, which was leading the force, had already turned around over Fukien Airfield. Suddenly, a single MiG appeared on the radar directly beneath Old's formation. The crews immediately tried to engage, but as they did, an emergency call rang out from other U.S. planes that had just arrived over Fukien. A MiG-21 had emerged from the clouds and was pursuing Old's flight from the rear. Captain Ralph Wetterhahn, one of the men responsible for planning the details of Operation Bolo, was flying on Colonel Old's wing. The MiGs were climbing up through the clouds in trail. And it wasn't just one MiG, but there's four of them. But they're not together, they're spaced out. So everybody starts looking around. And some of us see the MiG-21 at 6 o'clock, and some of them see a MiG-21 that's 8 o'clock, and as I come around, I see a MiG-21 at 10 o'clock. And we all think we're looking at one MiG-21. So Ole starts wheeling because he sees the one, and he starts turning. Now I lock up to the one I see at 10 o'clock, and Ole's just pulls right belly up to it, and I'm confused. I am really confused. And then finally I look and I see the other MiG. But we right away sandwiched ourselves between two. For several seconds, the radios were jammed with frantic transmissions. Olds maneuvered into position and fired a pair of sparrows at the MiG in front of him, but the missiles failed to lock on. He then let loose a pair of sidewinders, but they tracked toward the infrared heat of the clouds. All the while, Wetterhahn anxiously tried to warn Olds about the other MiG, which was struggling to get into firing position, but Olds was not responding. I pull off to the wing where Olds can see me because I'm not going to shoot across his wing and pickle a radar missile. And I feel it come off, but I never see it. And then I pickle the second one. And this one I see and it comes out 
nice and makes a nice little arc and then just starts tracking up. Boom! It was such a release at that point to see that for the first time to an enemy airplane, the thing that I had seen many times to our own airplane, that I just shouted on the radio. I got him, I got him, I got him. And you can, you can hear that emotion there that even to this day will give me chills and make my hands shake and my knees shake because I know how that felt for that instant and know that that guy's not going to kill me today. But that only lasts for about a second. And then the fight is back on because there's much, much more going on. I look behind and there's missile comms everywhere. And they're streaking out and they're like uh, skeletal fingers, you know, coming at you. And, and if they touch you, you're dead. But you, you don't know which ones are alive or not. You can just see the smoke trails. You can't see the missiles. And some of them have been there a few seconds and some of them are fresh. And you just, you don't have time to stare at each one and figure out what's going on. So you just ignore it all and keep turning and start looking for someone else to shoot at. By now, the North Vietnamese were well aware that they had been lured into a trap. The wolf pack systematically hunted down and killed six more MiG-21s, giving the Americans a much needed advantage in the skies over Vietnam. In January of 1967, the men of the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing turned the tide of the air campaign over Vietnam. Operation Bolo resulted in the destruction of nearly half of the North Vietnamese MiG-21s without a single American loss. The men felt they had proved that the MiGs could be beaten at their own game and that the F-4 was clearly superior to the Soviet MiG-21. Most attributed the success of Bolo to the uncommon determination and leadership of Colonel Olds. A few days after Bolo, he initiated another successful ruse in which a pair of Phantoms, mimicking a weather reconnaissance flight, downed two more MiG-21s. The triumphs of U.S. fighter crews dealt a serious blow to the North Vietnamese. For now, the enemy was subdued. After a short reprieve, American planes resumed their bombing campaign at a greater tempo than ever before. Both the Air Force and the Navy began launching multiple missions virtually every day, most of which contained upwards of a hundred aircraft. Increasingly, Vital targets, such as steel mills, power plants, and the rail lines heading from Hanoi to China, were repeatedly hammered. Several air bases were also opened to attack. And in a major climax to the Rolling Thunder campaign, President Johnson personally authorized strikes against the main MiG base at Fujian. A massive three-day effort severely cratered airstrips at the facility and damaged or destroyed at least 20 MiGs. But as the intensity of operations increased, so too did MiG opposition. U.S. fighter crews struggled to maintain air superiority. Larger assaults and new tactics took a toll on American strike forces. In the end, the North Vietnamese pilots still proved less effective than their U.S. enemy. MiGs downed at least 56 American planes, while the Americans killed 118 of theirs. The two-to-one kill ratio marked the poorest performance for U.S. airmen in any conflict. On April 1, 1968, President Johnson halted bombing missions against North Vietnam above the 19th parallel. By November, all Rolling Thunder operations had ended. While a debate ensued over how to improve the effectiveness of the U.S. fighter force, the air war over North Vietnam was indefinitely suspended. March 30th, 1972, 
During a suspension of the air war over North Vietnam, the communists invaded the South. A week later, President Richard Nixon ordered U.S. airmen to return to the skies over the North under Operation Freedom Train, a massive bombing campaign aimed at halting the flow of men and supplies pouring into South Vietnam. By early May, Nixon had expanded the campaign to include targets throughout the entire country under Operation Linebacker. North Vietnam used the long respite from air attacks to dramatically strengthen its military. By 1972, the North Vietnamese Air Force had been equipped with a combination of nearly 250 MiG-17s, 19s, and 21s. The most lethal assaults continued to come from the pilots of the 21s, who nearly perfected the strategy of sneaking up behind strike forces at low altitude, accelerating to supersonic speeds, firing their atolls, and rapidly diving away. The tactic provided little time for fighter crews to prevent an attack. Their greatest hope was to keep the MiGs literally off their tails, or as fighter pilots called it, the six o'clock. Our tactic to counter that was to do everything possible to clear six o'clock. In a flight of four, the two elements would cross each other. We would do 90 degree right and 90 degree left turns, 180 degree right, 180 degree left turn. So we were constantly maneuvering in the high threat area. The long bombing halt also provided North Vietnam with plenty of time to better train its pilots. Many of the airmen were new recruits who had been called upon to fill the ranks of squadrons depleted by heavy losses suffered during rolling thunder. But those that survived were able to hone their skills and learn to rely more on their combat experience than on restrictive guidance from ground controls. You could tell right when you got into a fight with them exactly what type of pilot you had. You know, if he stayed and, and was aggressive, you had a problem. He was one of the old guys, and he was going to stay and fight and do a good job at it. If he uh, looked like he was a new lieutenant and didn't know what he was doing, he was a new guy. Didn't understand the airplane. Had to live within the Soviet system of GCI control, which meant the flight lead for the flight was on the ground in the radar van controlling the flight. You can't have a time delay between you talking to somebody and them watching the radar and then tell you what to do. It, it's instantaneous. He died. The Navy and the Air Force took very different approaches to improving the effectiveness of their fighter forces during the bombing halt. The Air Force largely focused on technical problems, installing an internal gun on newer model Phantoms, developing improved airborne radar, and working to solve missile problems that had plagued crews for years. The Navy focused on training, initiating a postgraduate course in fighter weapons, tactics, and doctrine that came to be known as Top Gun. For three solid weeks, Navy Phantom crews flew simulated air combat missions at Miramar Naval Air Station in California against aircraft that closely resembled the MiGs. Only three days after President Nixon initiated Operation Linebacker, it became clear that the training had paid off. On May 10th, 1972, Lieutenant Randy Cunningham and his RIO, or Radio Information Officer, Lieutenant Willie Driscoll, joined up with more than 35 aircraft heading to strike a key rail yard between Hanoi and the port city of Haiphong. Their mission was to suppress anti-aircraft threats with cluster bombs and then to protect the force against the threat of MiGs. Cunningham and Driscoll reached the target area as planned, but were initially unaware that at least 22 MiGs had already launched and were preparing to intercept the force. I had bombed a, uh, a target area, and as I pulled off the target, I made a mistake. What you don't do is look back at the target. You look for MiGs and things. Looked over, and I was making a comment to Willie, look at this target we just hit. 
and my wingman, Brian Grant, called Duke MiG-17s at 7 o'clock. And we reversed just in time to see tracers from a MiG coming really high speed at us. Cunningham broke hard into the MiG, forcing the pilot to overshoot, quickly reversed back in behind him, and fired a sidewinder. The missile tracked directly for the MiG, blowing it to shreds. The crew began searching for other aircraft, but noticed that several of the MiGs had entered into a wagon wheel, a defensive strategy used by the North Vietnamese to provide mutual protection from the rear. The tactic posed little threat to airmen, as long as they attacked directly from the side, took high-speed shots as they passed through the circle, and didn't slow down. But two of the Phantoms had slowed down and were furiously maneuvering inside the wheel. Cunningham and Driscoll tried to help one of the F-4s, which was piloted by their commander. He was being pursued by at least two MiG-17s and a 21. But each time they came around the turn, all of the other MiGs began tracking them. I made every excuse that I could think of in my own mind to get out of there because in that kind of an environment, you're not going to survive 99 times out of 100. And I actually turned the airplane away and, and thought, I'll die if I go in there. And I actually got the airplane turned, started going away, and, I, and a thought came to me and said, if I leave, the XO is going to die. And how do I live with his wife and his children know that I didn't at least try? Cunningham and Driscoll turned back into the fight and began maneuvering in behind the MiG on their commander's wing. They struggled for several seconds to get a clear shot, fearing that a sidewinder might guide on hot exhaust from the wrong plane. Suddenly, an opportunity emerged, and Cunningham fired. The MiG exploded right beside his commander, but the Phantom remained intact. The other MiGs immediately disengaged and dove away toward Hanoi. Fearing that there could still be many more MiGs in the area, Cunningham and Driscoll began heading back toward the fleet. But their day was far from over. As the crew flew out toward the coast, a single MiG-17 appeared in the distance. Cunningham pressed the aircraft head-on to prevent the pilot from turning in behind him. Suddenly, the MiG's cannons lit up, forcing him into a steep climb. Ordinarily, North Vietnamese pilots disengaged once they lost a clear advantage. But this was no ordinary pilot. I fully expected this MiG, when I pulled up, and was going to turn into him like this to just run and unload and go to uh, Hanoi, and I was going to have to come back and chase him. Instead, as I went a little vertical and showed him a nose position, I came back over the top. We were in the pure vertical, and I looked back and saw a little set of goggles, a little white scarf, uh, and could see canopy to canopy going pure vertical with him slightly below me, the MiG driver. And we arced over the top, gave him a flight path, which is another mistake I made. He shot broke out of the flight of his bullets, put him right where I wanted him to at my 6 o'clock. That's not where I wanted him. Cunningham unloaded his aircraft, pulled up hard, and kicked the rudder over the top, positioning himself behind the MiG. But the MiG pilot responded, executing virtually the same maneuver. For several minutes, the two planes dueled in a furious dogfight repeatedly trading advantage for disadvantage in what's known as a rolling scissors. Suddenly, Cunningham recalled a similar engagement that an instructor pilot had put him through at Top Gun. He pulled up hard into a climb. Again, the MiG pilot stayed with him. But this time, he did the unexpected, executing a daring maneuver that was immortalized in the 1986 Hollywood thriller Top Gun. Just like in the movie, he started his nose up a little bit coming in in a position like this. Well, I chopped the throttle, put the speed brakes, and dropped the flaps, and he went out in front of me. 
And I had done that in training at Top Gun. It worked against the instructor pilot, and it worked against him because he's sitting up here, and that's where we shot him. The MiG attempted to escape straight down, but it was too late. Cunningham fired a single sidewinder. Several seconds later, he saw a brief flash and a trail of black smoke as the MiG flew into the ground. Cunningham and Driscoll were drained, but ecstatic. They had clearly met one of North Vietnam's most formidable pilots on the battlefield and had emerged victorious. They had also become the first aces of the Vietnam War, earning their third, fourth, and fifth kills during a single engagement. Incredibly, though, there was little time for either man to contemplate the significance of what had taken place. As they headed back toward the coast, an emergency broadcast warned that SAMs had been launched from the city of Nam Dinh. Cunningham looked toward the city just in time to see an SA-2 heading straight for him. The missile detonated several feet from the F-4, sending shrapnel into the plane's underbelly. Cunningham struggled to pull the plane into a climb and then managed to roll it some 50 miles out to the coast using only his rudder and afterburner. Mayday, mayday, mayday. My train, uh, 505. Shortly after reaching the Gulf of Tonkin, there was an explosion in the rear of the aircraft. Within seconds, the crew was forced to eject. Cunningham's back was injured during ejection, but ultimately, both men were pulled to safety in a daring joint recovery effort by Navy and Air Force personnel. Using their wits and weapons to the fullest, Cunningham and Driscoll, like so many others before them, had survived the thrill and the terror of air-to-air -air combat. While the men were showered with praise for their incredible accomplishment, ultimately, both were simply thankful to have made it out alive. I had helicopters come in under fire uh, and uh, you know rescue us out from that. There's a long story even in that rescue, so you can imagine pulling off a target, bombing a target, pulling off, getting jumped by 22 MiGs, going through three different engagements, uh, disengaging, getting hit with a surface-to-air missile, rolling an airplane 50 miles. Finally, the tail blows off. You're in a spin. You eject. Uh, it, it's a pretty emotional time. They, they have no concept of uh, what some of our kids went through. And many of them didn't come back. As the air war over Vietnam heated up, Navy fighter crews repeatedly demonstrated the value of Top Gun's training, achieving better than a 12 to 1 kill ratio against North Vietnamese MiGs, while preventing the loss of all but one of their attack aircraft. Air Force crews did not fare nearly as well. In fact, during June and July, their kill ratio dropped to an astounding 1 to 1. Many factors contributed to the dismal statistics, including the ability of the North Vietnamese to detect Air Force assaults much sooner than those launched by the Navy. But it was also clear that the concentration on technical issues rather than on tactics and training left many Air Force crews woefully unprepared for the intensity of air combat in 1972. We were not allowed to train the way we were going to fight, which was very unfortunate. We were not allowed to practice dissimilar. When I came back for my second tour in 1972, I was as prepared as someone could possibly be, and yet I had never faced an unlike airplane in a maneuvering situation. The first time I ever saw an unlike airplane in a maneuvering situation was a MiG-21 over Hanoi. The Air Force also experienced considerable difficulty in pairing up and keeping fighter crews together during linebacker. 
Navy crews were normally paired up in the same highly trained team for the duration of their cruise. Air Force pairings were often changed daily as new airmen arrived to replace those who were on temporary duty or who had fulfilled their 100 mission tour requirement. Many Air Force pilots fought hard to preserve crew integrity, handpicking not only their backseater, but the other six men that normally flew in their flight of four. It was a definite advantage to have two people under those conditions, both highly trained, and to be able to fly as a team all the time. Chuck DeBellevue and I flew over 100 sorties together. Chuck was the best of any of the backseaters at UDARN, and I was very fortunate to be able to select him to fly with me. We got to the point that we didn't have to say a lot to each other in the cockpit. I knew what Chuck needed, he knew exactly what I needed. Several improvements in Air Force equipment did pay off. One of the greatest developments took place on board DISCO, the Air Force's EC-121s that alerted air crews to the presence of MiGs. New radars were installed on DISCO and on Red Crown, a Navy radar control ship that allowed air crews to see exactly what enemy ground controllers saw. These new eyes and ears gave U.S. forces an unprecedented early warning system, especially to MiGs coming in at low altitudes. With this information, fighter crews could get into position before being seen by the enemy. A tactic which would soon pay off for Captain Ritchie. On July 8, 1972, he was leading four Phantoms on a mission to protect bombers on their way home. Flying his backseat that day, as he had dozens of times before, was Captain Chuck de Bellevue. As we headed towards Hanoi, you could hear the bandit calls, first from the northeast, then east, then southeast of Hanoi, then south, and then uh, Disco, the EC-121, the controller on there, he calls out Paula, which was our call sign, you're merged, which meant on his scope, everybody's in the same little piece of the sky. And uh, that was nice, except we didn't see anybody. It got us real concerned. And for about two minutes, there's eight guys with heads on swivels, checking six, looking around, trying to see, that, make sure nobody's behind us. Finally, we, I had a premonition or something, I don't know, maybe Steve probably had the same one. About the same time that they were in front of us, I looked up at 11 o'clock, and just to the left of the nose of the F-4, there was a black dot on a white cloud. It didn't belong there. And very shortly after that happened, we were line abreast going opposite directions with the MiG-21. Ritchie and De Bellevue were well aware that North Vietnamese pilots rarely ventured into combat alone. The crew started a slicing maneuver as if they were going to turn in behind the first MiG, but then held it there. Sure enough, a second MiG soon flashed by that had been setting up to fire on the men if they had turned in. Ritchie broke hard in behind the second MiG and followed his lead. We came into the fight behind the, the trailing guy, got a radar lock on, he was in a hard turn, and the missile went for the centroid of the, of the radar energy, which was right behind the canopy on a MiG-21 where the wings meet the fuselage. Well, right behind that is where the centroid of the radar energy was focused, and that's where the missile cut it into. It was still accelerating when it got to him. We unloaded because when one blew up, the, the second MiG would never stay. He'd always leave. And uh, our number four called up and said, hey, Steve, he's on me. MiG had come all full circle and was now chasing us. We came back into the fight, again locked onto the remaining MiG. He was on the edge of the scope, about 3,000 feet, 4,000 feet uh, away from us. And we fired one missile, and it cut him in two. It took a minute and 29 seconds. From tally-ho, the black fly speck on that white cloud, until splash two. Within two months of his dramatic double kill, Captain Ritchie downed another MiG-21, his fifth overall, to become the first Air Force ace of the war. 
Captain de Bellevue, the guy in back on four of those missions, ultimately earned two more kills with another pilot to become America's highest scoring ace in Vietnam. The achievements of both men received a great deal of attention. They, like so many American crews during Vietnam, put man, machine, and tactics to the test. Ultimately, U.S. forces shot down close to 200 MiGs. Despite their tremendous success, they are just grateful to have survived. Imagine being in an arena where living or dying depended on winning or losing. And you win and you live. It's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, of course, it wouldn't have happened without the tremendous team uh, and I've said to audiences all around the world that if it had not been for the thousands and thousands of young people doing their job day in and day out in a very professional and dedicated manner, not only would uh, Steve Ritchie not be a fighter ace, I probably would not be alive. Well-trained crews and ample weaponry weren't the only things that helped U.S. airmen succeed. There was also a weakness that the Americans ably exploited. North Vietnamese pilots were not allowed to operate freely. Every maneuver was tightly controlled from the ground. Had they been better, had they been allowed to be better, uh, we probably wouldn't have survived. I think I could have taken a dozen of our best pilots to Hanoi, flown the MiG-21 against U.S. forces, and U.S. forces would not have survived. I believe I could have shot down an F-4 every day if I were flying a MiG-21, because it was relatively simple for them to get into our rear quarter position, uh, supersonic, fire their atoll, and dive away. It's just that they weren't very good at it. Vast improvements in American fighter technology took shape in the years that followed the Vietnam War. But the most significant advances took place in tactical training. The Navy's top gun program continued to produce increasingly more competent fighter crews. The Air Force eventually formed an aggressor squadron that specialized in Soviet tactics and initiated Red Flag, a program that pitted the squadron against American and allied airmen from around the world. As veterans of the war returned home, they left behind an invaluable legacy lessons from real-world combat. Hopefully, these lessons would not only lead American planes and pilots to victory, but also save their lives. In the end, those who fought the war over Vietnam forever changed the nature of air combat.